Hello everybody, I'm really glad you could make it here today. If you're new around here, thanks for dropping by, and if you're a return viewer, it's good to have you again, I really do appreciate you. Now, today, I got a package, a bit of an early birthday present to myself. In it were a few things, but today, we're gonna to be taking a look at this. UM's BT42 and 172nd scale. I'm gonna be turning this kit into yet another video series for a few reasons, but the one applicable to this video is because a couple of months ago, I built their BT7 and I really enjoyed it. Don't let the small scale and the European plastic fool you, it's a pretty good kit. Probably the best kit UM has put on this scale, although that's just based on my own personal experiences. The thing got link and length track, some PE, and well, let's just take a look at those BT42 screws since I'm pretty sure that those two kits might have a few similarities though. Let's look at those screws to make sure. Before I take a look at the sprues, I wanted to show something interesting about the box. So, on the back of it, we not only have a lovely color painting guide, which should be fun to paint, we also have a description of an entirely different tank, which I found funny. Last time I checked, this was a BT42 kit, not an XD26 one. In this kit are four sprues, although two are duplicates, that being the running gear, we also have a photo etch fret and a decal sheet, but let's start off with the biggest sprue the kit has, that being the B sprue, which is the hull parts. In this sprue, we have the, the sides of the hull, the inner sides of the hull, I should say, which have the Chrissy suspension molded, at least the springs for it. We also have the, I guess, housings for the final drives. And we also have these arms, which are for the idler wheels. And you can see the Chrissy suspension back there. We also have the BT's fender. They're very large, angular, they're almost rounded, as well as the backplate. Yes, you're going to have to need a backplate for this tank, because when you attach the top and bottom hull, there is a bit of a gap. It's not like at the front nose, where you attach those and they fit flush, you do need a backplate, and that's what the kit provides. Additionally, you can see the outer side plates as well as the top of the hull. Yep, the outer side plates right there. I have to say, I like UM system. It provides a bit more rigidity than if there was just one of each hull side plate. In the sprue, we also have the bottom plate we have this circular engine cover we have some sort of box I think it goes on the back slope right there and we have the fenders as well as the air intakes now I don't know if this applies to the BT42 but when I built the BT7 I had to modify the air intakes from what I saw there was holes in it like for the air to go in in the intakes and so, yeah, on the BT-7, I had to remake mine, but this should be easier to do on this kit since the one in my BT-7s were pretty much attached to the hull. You can also see the suspension units for the Chrissy suspension, at least the springs. And I have to say, when I was building the BT-7, the spring parts were actual springs. They had, like, spring detail, and they weren't just cylinders, but that's fine since you won't be able to see it through those side pieces and everything gets covered up by the beach's large wheels you can also see the top plate right there right i think b i think um's plastic sorry about that is a bit smooth so i'm gonna be having to add some metal texture you can also see the driver's hatch and there should be a vision slit mounted but there isn't one so i'm gonna be having to add that myself it's not that big of a deal as you can see here is the bottom plate it has some pretty good detail there's lots of finely molded rivets and if you know me or you've seen any of my videos when it comes to rivets I'm a bit particular I'm looking at you Italeri and to lesser extent S model but yeah here is the bottom plate it is covered in many many fine rivets and it's quite pleasing to look at it's a shame that this is going to be covered up since the detail it is quite nice we also have a few hatches I think these are escape hatches but I'm not too keen on the actual BT itself and yeah, I'm just moving it in closer because I really am impressed with the rivets there. In UM's kits, they don't add rivets in all the places. I remember on the BT-7's turret, I had to add all the rivets there. But I mean, the rivets they do have 
they're pretty well done, I have to say. You know, if we're just talking about UM's molding, as a general, as a generality, their molding's pretty nice, I have to say. They're pretty good for the scale. And anyways, enough of me going on of this screw. Let's move on to the next one. Next up we have the track and running gear sprues and these sprues are pretty much identical at least 90% of the way so let's take a look at one of the sprues shall we. In it we have this long run of tracks. We have the running gear and all of the associated parts but in just speaking in terms of tracks we have everything else which is molded as individual links along with that long track run. Let's move over to this screw, right? We have most of the same stuff. We have the running gear, the wheels, we have the tracks, all in individual links. However, we have this track run. And I was quite disappointed when I first saw this because, I mean, it's the tracks. It's the tank. Tanks need tracks. And tracks have the ability to make or break your model. And it's not like, say, a panel or a rivet or something where you can easily scratch build it their tracks they are quite difficult to scratch build and i'm just hoping that i have a lot of leftover individual links however let's let's move away from that let's focus on the parts that are molded as you can see everything that is molded it looks pretty good one thing i have to point out though is that this track system is a lot different from the one on the previously built bt7 Everything's individual except for that long run. When I built the BT7, its tracks were more along the lines of traditional Lincoln Lens tracks. You know, there's a long section, a few slightly shorter ones, but the only individual links were the ones that go around the drive sprocket and the idler wheel. And yeah, I'm not sure why UM decided to go this route. From what I know, this kit came after the BT7, so it was a conscious effort on their part to make things, I guess, a little more complicated, even though the tracks went together really well and were one of the highlights of this kit, I would say. But moving on, we have um, that piece. I think it goes for the, uh, the idler wheels. We have an exhaust pipe, a shovel, a headlight. We have the idler wheel itself, as well as the rounded off sprocket. We also have this piece, which is the arm that mounts the drive sprocket. And on one end of it, oh no, no, that's wrong. It goes for the final um, road wheel, my bad. It sort of connects to the drive sprocket type area. Additionally, we have the arms for the alley wheels, which sort of look like, I guess, they remind me of car arms. I don't know car terminology whatsoever. And also we have the large road wheels, characteristic of Christie suspension tanks. Overall, I have to say that the molding is pretty good when UM decides to mold it. We have some very nice rivet detail on the wheels. We have a nice tire pattern on the wheels, those um, lines, which I don't show you because I am recording this voiceover a few days after the video footage. But I would say overall, UM's molding is pretty fair. And if this suspension goes together like the one I did previously, there should be no complaints, I hope. Here it is, the final sprue, and this is the sprue that turns this tank from a standard BT-7 to a BT-42, the turret sprue. On it we have these things which I'm not sure what are. We have the large turret envelope, we have the back of the turret and we have the gun in two halves. We have these things and a plug at the bottom of the turret which basically enlarges the turret ring. We also have these side pieces for the cheeks and the bottom of the turret. So I want to talk about that piece, right? Here's what it does. It plugs into the top of the hull. It plugs into that smaller turret ring and basically enlarges it for the larger turret. I do not like this at all. One thing that UM does, which just infuriates me, is that they don't mold tabs in their turrets. They just have these circles that plug into other circles. And while, yes, it might be more accurate, it makes things such a problem when you're trying to paint things. Here's the BT-7. It suffers from a similar issue, except this time the turret fixes via a pin. See what I mean? I don't like this at all, and I know UM isn't the only company who does this, but they do it on all their kits. And 
Once again, it makes painting such a hassle because, hmm, did the Finns use three color camo? You be the judge of that. But regardless of that, I do not like that turret piece. Additionally, let's talk about the gun barrel. It is in two halves as you can see. The detail is pretty fair, but the fact that it's in two halves just kills me. And the two halves being pretty much giant blocks, that might cause some issues. Additionally, the gun isn't hollow. Yes, there is a photo etched muzzle brake that you'll be attaching over it, but still, you're gonna have to hollow it out a bit. Is it perfect? No, and the fact that it's a large gun, it makes it slightly easier since on the smaller guns in this scale. I've come really close to breaking the gun barrel when I use my knife to drill it out, but still, it is such a pain and I don't look forward to gluing that gun barrel together. Additionally, you can see the rest of the parts. We have the large turret envelope, as I keep calling it, and it's very simple. It's pretty true to what it is, except we have that block. I'm not sure what that is. I might have to hollow it out, but I have to check my reference photos first. Additionally, we have those cheek pieces that go to it. They're very strange. They're mounted very strangely, and I can just see that these pieces end up creating a bunch of issues that I had no idea that they would have. Additionally, we have a bunch of flash on the turret envelope, although that's not too big of a deal. It should come off pretty easy with my knife. Last up, we have the PE fret and the decal sheet, and let's take a look at the PE fret first. In my experience, UM's PE is pretty brittle, but anyways, on the fret, the majority of it is taken up by the large engine grill, which you're going to have to bend into place and cut down. That was something I faced when I was building the VT7. We also have the muzzle brake over there, which you're going to have to bend into a cylinder. And additional parts, we have those rectangles that go under the engine grill. We have those triangular parts that are sort of part of the fenders. They go between the hull of the tank and the kit supplied fender parts. And if I'm correct, they also mount some stuff. You can put some things on there. I think headlights. And moving on to the decal sheet. I really like UM's decals. They're very thin. They're printed flat. They don't have an excess of shiny decal film. And they go together really nicely. In the, in the decal sheet, we have two types of Finnish swastikas. So finally, I can be part of that group of internet modelers or my posts get taken down just because there's a swastika on them, regardless of the type of swastika used. Of course, since the Finnish swastikas are different from the Nazi ones. But once again, I really like UM's decals. They're thin, they're matte, finely printed. And we also have an interesting marking option there, the swastika covered up by the red star. I do have to say though, the only problem I have with UM's decals is that there's an excess amount of decal film. However, this is pretty easy to deal with, and the fact that swastikas, or at least finished swastikas, are pretty much 90 degrees and straight lines, it should be pretty easy to fix. Before buying this kit, I read every inbox review I could find of it. The one on Modeling Madness, the one on Hyperscale, and the one on On The Way. And they all said the same thing, that the UMBT series was great and that this one was no exception. Well, guess what? I built the kit and I'm not just going off the sprues, because you know, this isn't just an inbox review, it's a build review. Here it is, this build took 3 days of pretty much non-stop building. Yes, 3 days is a pretty short time, especially since I've taken longer, to build kits in this scale that are much better. But just because you finish something quickly doesn't mean it's good. Just ask all the people I've dated. I don't want to get into this build in too much detail, since I'm going to be releasing a full build video where I tell you each flaw of the kit as I build it. But if you don't care to watch that video, here are a few quick points from it. The plastic was very soft, and parts broke off incredibly easily. The photo etch was similar, the muzzle brake proved impossible to roll into a perfect cylinder, and snapped on me. You have to cut the engine grate down to size. UM doesn't provide you any dimensions for that, which is weird since you usually have to modify at least one aspect in all of their kits, at least all of the UM kits that I've built. Not only are certain parts just wrong in general, like the fake turret sheet armor, some parts had to be fixed, since they failed to capture the look of the BT-42. 
things like cutting down and rebuilding the fenders and that sheet of plastic I had to put at the bottom of the turret. Some parts for the standard BT are just raw. The front plate shouldn't be sandwiched between the two side plates. It should sit in front of them. And of course, the tracks. If we can disregard the failed molding, the tracks are a big step back in terms of buildability. The tracks on that BT-7 went together extremely quickly since 90% of the track parts were in individual links. And the instructions. How do you expect a kit in this small of a scale to go together well when you jam everything into 9 steps with incredibly confusing and mislabeled diagrams? These are possibly the worst instructions I've ever come across, and UMs aren't that good to begin with. It's a bit of a new low. It seems that whenever I start a kit with pretty good expectations, it turns out to be quite the opposite. And to me, everything about this kit just screams wasted potential. Now, I've been looking forward to getting this kit for quite some time, for two reasons mainly. The first being that it's a Vigorous Mark 6B, and the second reason has more to do with my past experience with the S model. And yeah, having to add a bunch of rivets and scrag some panel lines and just modify the kit to, to be more realistic, it, it's really a pain. A couple of months ago, I built their BT-7 and I really enjoyed it. Don't let the small scale and the European plastic fool you, it's a pretty good kit. This kit is no exception. Not only are the BT-42 specific parts a massive pain to deal with, the standard BT-7 parts are a significant downgrade from the original kit, which was released 3 years earlier. If I were to describe this kit to anyone in the hobby, I would say that it embodies every stereotype we have when we think of Eastern European kits from the 80s to 90s, except this kit came out in 2005. Sure, it's a BT-42. If you're into weird, slightly lesser known tanks like I am, you'd appreciate there being a kit made out of it. But to be honest, the only thing this kit has going for it is that it is a BT-42. And the price. Dragon did make a kit of this tank, which I'd be interested in getting my hands on, though that's a bit besides the point. As a result, this is probably the worst tank I've ever built. It's on par with the Wargaming Sim event tank, which was one of the reasons why I started this channel. It was that bad. Sure, you can work around the issues. I certainly did. But there are so many things wrong with it, it's kind of insane. My build video, which is currently in the editing process, is around 24 minutes long. And almost 9 minutes of that video are of me pointing out issues with the kit. I think that says enough. Thank you for watching. If you liked the video, consider liking, subscribing, and even commenting. I do go through all of them. And as promised, this kit will be getting its own series, so look out for part 2 where we go through the build in a bit more detail. Once again, thanks for watching, and I'll be seeing you in the next video. Whenever that is.